Rushwood Center at Ryerson Woods presents the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Rushwood Center is located in the Ryerson Woods Forest Preserve in Riverwoods, Illinois, and honors this land as the traditional home of the Council of Three Fires. Today, Brushwood Center continues to be a place where many people from diverse backgrounds find healing, vitality, and relationship with nature. You can learn more and support this work at brushwoodcenter.org. Now is the time to create a more resilient tomorrow. This year, the Smith Nature Symposium Series explores what it will take to build a more just and sustainable future in the aftermath of COVID-19. Welcome to the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Thank you, Danny. Uh, my name is Ted Hafner and I work at Open Lands. I'm a landscape architect and climate fellow there. And uh, the title of our, our conversation today is It's Raining, It's Pouring. And uh, we are gonna be exploring uh, nature-based solutions for climate change in the built and uh, natural environments um, with, with a focus on health. Um, and just a little bit about Open Lands and where I come from this. Uh, open Lands is a nonprofit in Chicago that does regional open space and uh, urban, uh, urban open space and regional con conservation, excuse me. Um, and I want to kind of go through uh, nature based solutions, if I could, please, Danny. So, nature based solutions are inspired and supported by nature, they're cost effective, and they simultaneously provide environmental, social, and economic benefits to help build resilient communities. Uh, there are three ways to do that generally it's by protecting intact ecosystems. That makes the biggest uh, dent in, in, in these nature-based solutions, but also restoring native ecosystems is very important. And then improving practices on working lands. And right now that's uh, sort of tiered to the agricultural sector, uh, but I would argue that that could be a much broader definition because basically everywhere we are is, is, is a working land of some sort or another. Next slide, please, Danny. So what are the benefits of these nature-based solutions? Uh, they can be economic, environmental, social. Uh, they can encompass jobs and livelihoods, sustainable commodities, uh, and cleaner air, water, and uh, more healthy biodiversity. Uh, nature-based solutions refers to the sustainable management and use of nature for tackling socio-environmental challenges much like climate change or water security, water pollution, food security, human health and disaster risk management. Uh, my guess is we're gonna touch on a lot of those today. So I'm really excited for this presentation. Next slide, please, Danny. Um, and, and just so that you have a mental picture of what nature-based solutions look like, they, they look like all of this on the screen in front of you. They're dunes and beaches, they're wetlands, uh, urban green spaces, restorations, uh, reefs, things like that, uh, green roofs, all of those things. Uh, so we're, we're gonna look at some of these, uh, as I said, in application to the built and natural environment and how they impact our health. Um, one of the reasons that we're focusing on this today is because uh, the Northeast Illinois has found in the last 30 or 40 years that our rainfall has been increasing. And to this end, um, one of our major data sources was recently updated last year uh, and released showing that that for two year storms to 100 year storms, uh, our rainfall in northeastern Illinois is increasing from a third of an inch to almost over an inch uh, for for each of those storms and it goes up in between the two and the 100 year storm. Uh, so now that we're getting more water. Hopefully this panel will explore some of the impacts of this increased water and, and how we deal with it. Um, to this end, next slide, Danny, please. We have Elena Grossman, who is a program manager at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health. 
we have Erin Fagstead, which is, Erin uh, is a senior ecologist at Stantec, uh, which is an uh, engineering firm that, that does ecological restoration, uh, myself as the moderator. And then Vidya Venkataraman, um, a postdoc fellow at, at the School of Anthropology in Northwestern University. And I think we're gonna start with hearing a little, a uh, couple slides from each of the panelists and then I'll get into questions and your own questions. Go ahead, Aaron, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, so a quick introduction uh, about me and really my connection to nature. So as, as Ted mentioned, I'm an ecologist. I work with Stantec, we're a really global consulting firm. Um, and I work uh, as a restoration ecologist. And I'll really come at this from that perspective. And, and, you know, nature has a really meaningful impact on my life. You know, early in my life, I, I was exposed to nature through outdoor activities, you know, things like hiking and fishing and camping. And this really led me to pursue a career in the environmental field. You know, so I went on to graduate school. Um, in graduate school, I studied how environmental changes and climate change over the last 15,000 years impacted grasslands on the Great Plains. So early in my career, armed with my new education, armed with enthusiasm, armed with my expanded view of the world, um, uh, I took to you know, working throughout the Midwest and I was immediately confronted by really the impacts of human, humans on nature. And I saw it everywhere I went and uh, quite honestly, it was, it was alarming to me. And so while the scale of those impacts was really depressing early on. I, I really witnessed the tremendous resiliency of nature and really quickly learned to appreciate the benefits of ecosystem restoration. So really uh, almost 20 years into my career now, what is most rewarding to me is to see really the positive impacts of these nature-based solutions on our environment, on our natural environment and our built environment, and really how those projects bring together uh, community and nature. So I'll kind of be hitting on that angle today here um, for, the, for the next couple of minutes. Uh, next slide, Danny. So like I said, I consider myself an ecosystem restoration ecologist. So I really take an integrated approach to management of land, water, and living resources, including human landscapes, um, to restore uh, ecosystems and the critical services they provide. So the United Nations in the early 2000s, right around the, the millennium, uh, issued a Millennium Ecosystem Report and really they assess the consequences of ecosystem changes on human well-being and they really put it ecosystem services or the things that benefit uh, humans into four buckets. On the upper left is sustenance services, things like providing food and water, uh, building materials and medicine. Uh, on the bottom left are cultural services. Uh, these provide inspiration to humans, uh, pursuit of knowledge, understanding of the natural world, spiritual connection, art connection. And I'll say that in, the inspiration uh, from nature is, is, is definitely what drew me to a career in the environmental field and what I carry with me today. Uh, on the bottom right are the building blocks. These critical services are the ones that really make all the other services possible. Uh, these are really the foundational uh, aspects of ecosystems that make sustenance and inspiration in our last category, resiliency, uh, possible. So that last, last category, resilience or regulation services, those are, those are the ones that are really important for our discussion here today. It's, it's nature-based solutions, it's nature itself providing clean air and water and, and pollination, uh, regulation of climate change, uh, disease resiliency um, uh, for, for humans. And next slide. So as we think about, um, Ecosystem services, they're certainly uh, very important. I'm gonna talk about the economics of those in a little bit here. Um, but I think it's important to put it in the context of, you know, what is the state of the region's ecosystems? This is probably a little bit preaching to the choir, but I think it's important to understand here and how it relates to the climate discussion. Uh, next slide, Danny. So we see, you know, frequently new in the news calls for protection of the, the, the rainforests in the tropics, uh, protection of other biomes ranging from polar ice caps to coral reefs. And those are really significant efforts because those, those biomes represent tipping points in the regulation of Earth's client, climate. Um, but I believe it's also important to talk about our, our, our local landscapes. And we've already experienced our catastrophic loss of native ecosystems. 
you know, it's already happened for us in Northeast Illinois and Illinois, and then really the Midwest in general. You know, the fact is Illinois has lost 90% of their wetlands since the late 1700s. So that's about eight and a half million acres. Uh, we have very little uh, remnant prairie remaining. Uh, we've lost 21 million acres of prairie and 83% of our oak ecosystems have been lost since the mid 1800s. So we're left asking ourselves, you know, what do we do about it? Uh, you know, what are the solutions moving forward? Next slide, Danny. So how is it important to the climate discussion? Well, we know the healthy ecosystems naturally regulate climate, provide resiliency and adaptations. And we know that ecosystems can be very successfully restored and an ecosystem approach can be integrated into the built in agricultural landscapes like Ted mentioned. So land preservation, uh, restoration and stewardship is one aspect. We need to preserve more lands, we need to restore more lands, and then we need to steward those lands in order to realize those services. We also understand how, how our relationship with land is important. How we use land is another aspect of that discussion. We know that destructive patterns of land use account for a, a really significant portion of human-caused greenhouse gases. So we need nature-based solutions that work with the land and not against it. Next slide. Healthy ecosystems are a really important component of climate resiliency. Scientific studies show that healthy ecosystems provide higher value services. That is, they provide uh, more ecosystem services and greater quality. And as a result, healthy ecosystems are more resilient. For example, in Northeast Illinois, we know that diverse prairies capture and store more carbon. We know that they infiltrate more stormwater. We know that healthy streams that are connected to their floodplains help alleviate flooding. They help uh, cycle nutrients more uh, than unhealthy streams or things like ditches. And we also know that diverse landscapes, ecosystems that are connected on the landscape provide even greater number and quality of services and are even more resilient, which leads to a discussion on the concept of stacked benefits. When we look at ecosystem services, when we look at the work that we can do uh, to improve the fate of our local ecosystems, a discussion in the context of all the services that a project or, or a restoration or preservation is providing is really important. So for example, we can restore a wetland to reduce flooding downstream, but we might be missing the bigger picture. If we, if we scale out and zoom out a little bit and look at the watershed and incorporate a stream restoration and a prairie restoration and a woodland restoration, we can provide a lot more ecosystem services uh, as a result. Next slide. And so I think, you know, as I've been doing this for close to two decades, as we reflect back on those ecosystem services, really nature means something different to everyone, right? The, the benefits that we get from nature are very individualized. It depends on uh, where you come from, your circumstances in life, how you interact with nature. But I found that one language we all talk is dollars and cents. Uh, so I think uh, framing the discussion around the, the consequences of those uh, ecosystem losses and the cost to put them back is really beneficial. So based on some recent studies in this emerging field of natural capital accounting, we know that ecosystem services provide uh, in US dollars 21 to $72 trillion of services per year. And there's this, there's this perception out there that restoration projects are just net costs, that they're, they're expensive to do, um, but you re don't realize those benefits back and that, that's simply not true. Uh, Open Lands in 2016 commissioned a study that showed that for every $1 spent on local restoration, that four to six dollars re is returned to the community as a result of those restorations. And the benefit cost ratios can be even higher. You know, for example, a study in 2013 showed that grassland uh, restoration can provide return on investment of 35 to one, largely uh, due to carbon sequestration and stormwater benefits of grassland restoration. And I think too, as we look regionally, certainly there's been a lot of work done, um, including by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency of Planning. Um, but we can also look to urban other, area, other urban areas, for example, examples and other case studies. Um, one would be Katy Prairie, which is a large 20,000 plus acre coastal prairie in the Texas uh, area, just outside of Houston. And the fact is other parts of the US are experiencing significant ecosystem loss. For example, just in the Houston area alone, over a 10 year period, they lost 80,000 acres of wetland. And that loss, a loss of about 25,000 acres was found to be a loss of about $650 million in stormwater detention. 
And this was really highlighted during the Hurricane Harvey um, impacts to the region when they already received 50, 50 inches of rain and Katy Perry was really monumental in, in preventing uh, additional, even worse flooding in that region. So really when we come at this from an economic angle and start, start talking dollar and cents and comparing, you know, what is, what is the cost uh, to do an infrastructure project and what is the added cost to bring in nature-based solutions? It's really important to talk about a, a benefit cost um, aspect of that. Next slide. And finally, I just wanted to call attention, really the time is now to, to, to be doing this. The time was yesterday, honestly. Uh, the United Nations has declared 2021 to 2030 the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. And that's really the recognition that globally, a huge part of this conversation has to be on ecosystem restoration. I would also throw in preservation, uh, stewardship, and also sustainable uh, uses in built environments and agricultural landscapes. And really, as Ted mentioned, it's, it's the build, build back better approach. You know, we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we know it can be done. Now is the time to do it at the regional scale, uh, even at the individual scale. And that's it for me. Hi everyone, my name is Elena Grossman and I am the program director for Building Resilience Against Climate Effects, which is a CDC funded program. We're housed at the U University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health. And we are working with the Illinois Department of Public Health to help build the capacity of Illinois' public health system to be able to better address the health effects from climate change. Um, I am going to be talking a lot about the doom and gloom of climate change. I like to throw in the, what can we do about it? Um, but as Ted and Aaron have talked about the nature-based solutions, there are so many co-benefits of those, and we'll talk about that later, not just for climate health, but for our physical and mental health. Next slide, please. So what you're looking at is um, our friend Grover from Sesame Street, you might remember him. He's doing his infamous near-far routine. And I like to use this slide to help illustrate how psychologically we as humans have a really hard time thinking about what's gonna happen in the future. Where will we be in the future? We connect with the, need, with the here and the now. And a lot of time, climate, climate change is associated with the future. Yes, there are lots of disasters going on, but people still perceive it as something that's gonna happen in the future when we talk about climate projections. And think about when you're at a job interview and you have the question of, where do you see yourself in five years? We hate that question because it's so hard to see ourselves in five years, let alone what the earth is gonna be like in 2080. But we do connect with our health um, and the here and the now. So what I'm actually gonna uh, initially share with you are some stories of people and how climate change is impacting their health. Next slide, please. So this is Dorothy Williams. She lives in a South Chicago suburb. And she has sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is an inflammatory disease. They don't know why it happens. And it can attack any organ in our body. For her, it attacked her lungs, which means that she has to be very cautious as to when she goes outside. So she follows the EPA's air quality index, which is a color scale of air quality. So purple is the worst quality, think wildfire. Um, and then it goes red, orange, yellow, green to being the healthiest. And she said that even when it's yellow, she has to be cautious about going outside um, because she has a hard time breathing and it's just not pleasant. Uh, and so she is really paying attention to how the days of our air quality are changing and becoming um, just, there are more of them. Next slide, please. This is um, Dorothy, I'm sorry, Pam and Tony Monsky from Manuka, Illinois. And they suffered from the, the 2013 floods. Their home was destroyed. Uh, three years later, they were still repairing it. Their deductible doubled. They lost a number of personal um, items, many articles from their families that they had carried on through generations. Um, and there was a lot of stress, the financial stress of their home, um, but also the personal stress. During the actual flood, they said that they were actually watching the water come in 
from the from their floor and there was nothing they could do about it and then subsequent stress of cleaning up next slide please and this is an image from the 1995 chicago heat wave um, it was the 25th anniversary of this devastating heat wave in july it killed over 700 people it is still to date the the most fatal heat wave of all in the united states and Heat is actually the number one killer of all natural disasters. You can't see it like you can see a flood or a hurricane or a wildfire, but it's deadly. This image is of unclaimed bodies. The Cook County Coroner's Office was so overwhelmed with bodies that they had to create a mass grave. When I look at this image, I see a war-torn country. I don't see the city of Chicago as a result of a heat wave. Next slide, please. So this is an infographic that we put together culminating all of the health effects from climate change. I talked about respiratory health um, as we're experiencing worsening air quality. Uh, respiratory health conditions will be exacerbated. I talked about mental health that primarily for Illinois comes as a result of floods. So all the public health implications from floods which also include waterborne diseases, um, which you can get from contaminated water as our drinking water systems can become overwhelmed. Um, sewage can then get into our drinking water and the systems that clean it out might become overwhelmed. Um, and in fact, almost 70% of all waterborne disease outbreaks in the United States happened after an extreme precipitation event. And then mold, as well as injuries and fatalities from floods. So there are a number from floods. Um, and then I also talked about heat. That's the most direct link. Um, there's a spectrum of heat-related illnesses. There are the most benign, like heat rash or heat cramps, all the way to heat stroke, which is the most fatal. Um, and I didn't talk about vector-borne diseases. Those are diseases transmitted. For our purposes, we're of most concern uh, from ticks and mosquitoes. Um, in Illinois, there's actually a geographical divide when it comes to ticks. Um, we see a lot of Lyme disease in the north. We see a lot of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the south. And then for mosquitoes, we're really concerned with West Nile virus. That's the big one. There are other tick-borne diseases that, um, like Zika, um, that there is maybe some concern about, but the question is, how likely will those mosquitoes be able to survive in Illinois? Um, and then as I talked about mental health, you know, I, we associate that primarily with floods, but we pulled it out as its own health effect because it's a really critical health effect that has chronic implications. After Hurricane Katrina, um, they looked at a study of people who, who suffered from that hurricane five to eight months after the hurricane and then a year later all of the mental health conditions actually went up over time and then they found 12 years later they were still seeing cognitive disabilities from people who um, suffered from the hurricane next slide please so um you know i wanted to point out that climate equity climate justice um, you know, that's a real challenge that we are going to face. Climate change is often referred to as a threat multiplier, and that means that climate change will aggravate other existing stressors, such as poverty, environmental degradation, weak infrastructure, political instability, and other social stressors like racism. And all these disasters underscore these existing societal problems, and climate change, as we're seeing it increase the frequency and severity of all these natural disasters, it will exacerbate not just the health consequences that I talked about, but low-income communities and communities of color will be the most impacted. Um, and so what you're looking at are maps after, as a result of the 95 Chicago heat wave of highest, this is at the neighborhood level, so highest um, heat-related death rate, lowest uh, per capita income, and highest crime rate. And you know, you can see that the same neighborhoods are being impacted by all of these things that you would think don't have anything to do with each other. Next slide, please. 
And now we're gonna look at COVID, right? This is the disaster that we're seeing right now. Now this map is slightly different because it's at the zip code level. So it looks a little different. And there are a couple outliers where you see some neighborhoods on the far north side that have a high mortality rate. But I drew a circle in the middle that really shows those are zip codes that fall into the same neighborhoods that had that were most impacted during the 95 heat wave. And you can see that 25 years later, those same neighborhoods are still struggling. And this isn't just climate justice, this is environmental justice, racial, racial justice, and income justice. And so we are going to have to really address this equity piece. Next slide. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, that's my contact information. I'm gonna pass it on so we can then have our conversation. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Vidya Venkatramanan and I am a researcher at Northwestern University's Center for Water Research. Uh, my background is also in global public health <laughs> um, and I've largely worked on infectious diseases and water sanitation and hygiene. But one of the really neat things about public health is that it um, intersects with pretty much every aspect of human life uh, as we see so viscerally in our um, lives today with COVID. Not only that, but also our intersects with our interactions with the natural world, right? So while I'm trained in public health, um, and Elena so nicely you know, described all of these different health-related outcomes, I don't actually directly look at those mental or physical health outcomes, um, but it's instead all the stuff that's kind of around it. So next slide, please. So this is called the socio-ecological framework, and it's something that really drives a lot of the work that we do. And it essentially um, is a, it's a useful way of demarcating all the different levels at which um, we have influences on our health and also on environmental health. And it's important to consider all of these different um, levels and all the factors that are at play in each of these levels. Next slide, please. So at the Center for Water Research where I work, um, the team that I'm working with is particularly interested in these intersections that you see here um, between the natural world, the built environment, and people, right? And so and the people piece includes not only health, but also their, their cultural factors and overall well-being. Um, and we're, so we're looking at um, uh, nature-based solutions. I'm not sure if there's an animation. You may just want to go next slide. Thanks. Um, oh, back one. Thank you. Um, so we're really interested in looking at nature-based solutions such as green infrastructure, this is of a bias whale, um, and what kind of role that would play in mitigating the effects of extreme weather events such as um, heavy precipitation, that's as everyone else has described, only being made worse uh, due to climate change um, that can lead to consequences such as flooding. Um, so on the social science side, I'm trying to understand what are all the different uh, factors at play. Um, next slide, please. So for example, I collaborate closely with the Nature Conservancy um, at large and also um, at, in, in Illinois, um, who are really keen to understand this people piece, not only to preserve and protect nature, but also to figure out in what ways nature actually benefits people. And how can we, um, in the words of my closest collaborator at TNC, um, Ms. Deborah Williams, she says, how can we get people to connect with people and then people with nature? So the picture on the left is an example of um, one of the main ways that they engage um, with communities um, is through youth. So this is of a program that I evaluate for them um, each year on youth engagement. And how do we basically um, invite people into conversation to better relate with the nature that's around them? Um, Markham, Illinois is home to some of the fewest patches of remnant prairie that are left in our state, as I understand it. So how do we have youth that live in these uh, neighborhoods to actually connect more um, with the nature that's there. Um, and a lot of the, the work that I do essentially uses, so it's about community engaged work and it's how do we um, better understand people's experiences through surveys, through interviews, group discussions, community meetings. So the right, the picture on the right is an example of a community-based project that we are doing currently in Evanston, um, where we're interviewing folks um, around the city. We're trying to ensure that we reach communities um, and groups that are typically left out of the conversation. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking black and brown communities, regardless of income. But in this case, this picture is also um, of folks who are currently homeless. And how, what are their experiences with water insecurity? What are their experiences with flooding? And how does it affect their lives? We're also importantly 
um, really interested in asking people about their experiences with nature. So we do a lot of work to understand what are people's preferences and their priorities? Do they even feel like they belong in nature? As Elena pointed out, the issue of environmental justice and environmental racism, this is huge. And I can say this personally, and we can go into that um, you know, when we discuss as a panel as well, how much of a difference it makes. Um, so when we wanna think about uh, solutions, nature-based solutions for things like flooding, we also need to come up with localized solutions that are actually pertain to the folks who will most benefit from it. Um, next slide, please. So I'll just close by saying that I'll argue that both the fields of public health and environmental, you know, the, the broader field of the environment, I'm putting in quotes, of which I both belong to, have a long history of saying that, you know, we know what's good for you, so now just do it. Um, you'll see a lot of that also in our current world right now with COVID, right? But I'm more interested in trying to meet people where they're at, understand what their knowledge is, in this case about flooding and green infrastructure. Um, what are their attitudes? What's their behavior? How does that influence their intention to actually use something? And then how do we tailor solutions that are you know, sustainable, that people will actually take and use and maintain? And as a result, it'll help their health and well-being and hopefully the well-being of the planet as well. So that's sort of the community-based angle from which I'm coming at this from. And I'll leave it at that, thanks. Thank you all. Um, I wish we had sort of another hour to explore all the questions here. Um, I, I think that the first question that I'm gonna ask is gonna start with a story. And, and this story goes something like, hmm, 10 years ago when I was a landscape architect practicing in Chicago, I went to our annual awards benefit, right? And our keynote speaker was someone from the federal uh, Department of Public Health, very high up, and he swore that um, landscape architects and public health officials were going to merge because of the, the design needs for uh, public health things like crossing streets, uh, so you don't have to walk, I don't know, a half a mile to get to an intersection, things like six mile roads. How do we design our systems better to deal with public health? And I, I think that's really central to this. Um, 10 years later, as a practicing landscape architect, I've, I've had jobs at hospitals uh, where we've done hospital grounds and things like that, but I haven't seen this intersection really happen between design nature and, and public health. Um, where do we go from here? What, what, what's the future? How do we crack this nut? Uh, to all of you, I think. Yeah, I can start at the sort of more, the earlier level as an academic, for example. I think it also starts with how we train young people. So for example, it, I, I, I did my um, you know, graduate work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where we actually have the planning department and the public health and environmental science programs all interlinked. So at whatever stage, whether you're undergraduate, master's or PhD, trying to actually understand those intersections early on can also help you once you start to go out into practice to look for those connections. So I think it starts right there in my opinion. Elena or Aaron, any extra thoughts? Yeah, I almost, I would almost say that it, it needs to even start earlier. <laughs> um, I've, I've gone to some elementary schools and some middle schools to talk about um, climate change and health. And, you know, vector-borne diseases are, are always a big hit because mosquitoes and ticks are disgusting and there's lots of shrills and they're very curious about it. But, you know, there's no connection between um, thinking about how do we improve our health through nature-based solutions. You know, I think it's a very, we start at a very young age where um, health is thought of more as uh, being treated as opposed to prevention. And I think that's a big factor too. I, I always like to think of, you know, medicine is you treat an individual who's already been sick. Public health is ensuring that communities prevent from ever getting sick. Um, and I think that talking about prevention at starting at a young age, but definitely in college and maybe even in colleges of medicine, 
um, I think would be very, very beneficial because you'll, you'll really see that connection with nature-based solutions because it's not just about the earth's health, right? There, there are links, you know, I think about 10 years ago, that's when diabetes and obesity, it still is a big public health problem, but that was really driving public health work. Um, and so there was a lot of conversations about active transportation and designing streets that allow people to move more, whether it's biking or walking or running. Um, and so obviously that has a really big benefit to uh, slowing down climate change. And it also has a really big benefit to our mental health, respiratory health, right? So there, there's so many combinations, but it's all about prevention. And so I think um, having a conversation or, or starting at a very young age that we're talking about prevention and what can we do to prevent these health effects, you'll be able to insert a lot of the nature-based solutions. Aaron, anything to add? Uh, I'm sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, you know, I, I, I love those suggestions. I think, you know, the first thing I thought of was, was, was my connection to nature when I was young, starting young. Um, so video definitely covered that. And, you know, I think that a couple of more ideas. So I think that speaking in terms that people understand. So like I talked about with the ecosystem services, like oftentimes it's not enough because a lot of these issues can be politicized. It's not enough to just say, well, we need to do more prairie restoration because it's gonna help with climate change. Now, climate change is a non-starter for a lot of people. So talking about it in terms that, that they can understand and how it's gonna benefit them. And I think that really speaks to also the, the fair and equitable, equitable access to nature to areas that have undergone nature-based solutions because it is gonna matter where you're from and what, how, it, how climate change is, is impacting you. Um, and I'll also say, you know, I, I, I agree with you, Ted. I think that we don't see enough of the intersection, but I will say that I'm seeing it more. So I do work with Stantec, we're a large architecture engineering firm, and there is a push, there's not enough people doing it, but there is a push to drive that intersection. So we, we need to have more conversations like this, more panels like this, and we need to encourage recognize, and recognize uh, in a really positive way the folks that are, are driving that conversation, are on the ground making it happen. You know, we really need to highlight that. Well, and, and as a, a plug for Catherine and Brushwood, you know, they, they do a lot of work in the, the healthcare industry and with healthcare in general. So you know, I think it's a start, but we need to go a lot further. Um, I have a couple more questions, I think, before we run out of time and turn it over to the audience. Uh, Aaron, you mentioned ecosystem services in, in your talk and sort of the, the dollars and cents portion of it, right? I, I kind of feel like ecosystem services are, is, is the bud, buzzword that, I don't know, resilience or green infrastructure is today, right? Um, and, and it's famously hard to account for. It's really complicated. Um, and, and so I, I'm wondering to all of you, well, how do you deal with this complexity and how do you bring this notion of economics and dollars and cents into ecosystem services in your line of work in terms of nature-based solutions? I, I, I don't know, Elena or Vidya, if, if you actually even think about this, but um, you know, I think Aaron has a point in terms of monetizing this to show the, the benefits and um, the incentives to do this work. Yeah, we definitely think about that. And I think the complexity part is the biggest challenge, um, not just in doing some sort of cost benefit analysis, but also just in talking about it. Um, I, you know, a, a wise epidemiologist uh, once said, um, you know, keep it simple, stupid, whenever talking about anything. Um, and it's really hard to keep this topic simple. And I, and I constantly struggle with how to keep it simple and, and obviously not using jargon words. In terms of the economic side, um, my, so I, so Brace Illinois is one of 16 states and two cities that have the Brace grant from CDC. And we are constantly talking about this need to do some type of economic analysis of you know how much um how much do these costs do these health effects cost uh the nat the natural resource defense council actually recently came out with a paper that tried to do just that 
where they took individual events um, from different states throughout the country to try to estimate how much did this one heat wave cost or how much did this one, but not just the, I was going to say flood. And obviously there's a, a large component to like the property loss, but the health side of it um, in terms of hospitalization care, but also work days lost. Um, and, you know, they, they tried to pick every single health effect and try to do an economic analysis. And we've talked about doing that more um, to highlight how preventing, which would come into the nature-based solutions. I don't have like the background to, you know, how much would that cost in comparison to, but just this idea that prevention, generally speaking, is cheaper than curing. I won't argue with any of that, of course. I mean, I think the dollars and cents ultimately is <laughs> the language that the planet speaks, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, I think, I hope this is not too naive or idealistic a response here, but I think those, the, the economic analyses matter a lot more at the policy level, right? to have those large scale changes, no doubt, that that's ultimately what policymakers will listen to. But I'm kind of thinking at even the very local level. So when we think about urban flooding and we think about trying to come up with solutions for very, very localized solutions for stormwater flooding. Sometimes the economics may not pan out in the way that we want. And by we, I mean those of us wanting nature-based solutions in place. So, you know, I'm thinking of in Markham, Illinois, where uh, we have the Indian Boundary Prairies. Now, people want that to be turned into, you know, economic development land, like put up businesses, put up, you know, storefronts there. Economically speaking, that may end up being the more valuable piece um, than the economic benefit that the prairies provide in terms of flood management, possibly. No one's done the analyses as far as I know. But are there other ways to connect with people that I'm talking at a very local level that go beyond the, the dollars and cents that say, well, what about the feeling that you have? This is, you know, we're the prairie capital of the prairie state. What kind of pride does that bring up in you? Um, does it provide all of these other uh, mental and physical health benefits to you um, that the dollars and cents may not actually speak to? So at times, I think we may also need to be strategic about the economic analyses um, for the end goal that we're interested in. Anything to add, Aaron? I, I agree with both, and I think Vidya makes a great point. I really think you have to be strategic about it. You know, I think in looking at you know, for example, the, the Markham Prairie, you know, what is the benefit of economic development versus what are the benefits we're getting out of the prairie is a different conversation than, hey, I want to, I'm a mis municipality, I'm proposing a very traditional non-nature-based non uh, stormwater pond versus I could be doing a wetland restoration somewhere in the watershed. So I think it really depends on, on the, the economics uh, of the situation, really what, what the goals are, and really, again, going back to those services, what, what is the most important part uh, or service for that community, for that set of people? You know, so, you know, I think the way I look at it is, uh, I, I think the economics are more clear on, on nature-based solutions where you're looking at, uh, you know, for example, a restoration of a native ecosystem versus just more of the same uh, engineering. I just have one final comment and it's, it, Vidya can probably speak to it at a much more articulate level than I can, but I think this is where um, getting communities input before doing it is really critical um, because it might, it might involve a conversation and uh, a dialogue going back and forth um, that, you know, there could be a really positive end result or maybe it was you know one nature-based solution that you that the the people coming in were thinking of but maybe the community was thinking of a different one but the end result is still positive and i think ensuring that that conversation happens um i think that's really critical and at all this one one final point i don't i don't think we do a very good job really recognize, we get very tunnel visioned on, on our solutions for, we're very reactive. We're reactive to flooding, we're reactive to climate change. Oh, we need to 
uh, put up a new pond somewhere. Well, I think we need to really focus in on what are all of the benefits to the community? What are the, you know, and, and that, that the community needs to speak to that. You're right, it's, it's gonna vary by community. And I think that's the point that one, it's not a one size fits all solution. All the communities are not gonna have the same resources and they're not gonna have the same opportunities. Um, but it needs to be a part of the conversation that, you know, this project is a flood, re flood retention, flood attenuation project, but there's all these other benefits if we do it this way. And those are the benefits that I hope through natural capital accounting and that really that is an emerging field, we're starting to better understand what that means in dollars and cents. So I wanna take my last question before we open it up and shift gears a little bit. Uh, we, we, we've talked a lot about conversation and, and outreach. Um, how, do, how do you do authentic outreach and what are the, experiences that you encounter, the terms and language that you encounter when you talk about nature-based solutions in, in, in terms of implementing them to deal with a particular issue, whether it's flooding, heat, uh, disease, storm, or mental health benefits. Um, do you want to go first, Aaron, since you're up mute? Yep. That's a really good question. You know, as a, as a consultant, I I get to do that when my clients want me to, uh, but as a, a volunteer, as an educator, as somebody who's active in the community, um, I try to get out and really uh, advocate for nature-based solutions. Um, and I think it, for me, it's really dumbing it down. Uh, it's not trying to speak too technically. It's trying to speak in a, in a language that uh, everyone can understand and really try to understand what are the interests. It's all the way down to the individual level. If I'm talking with a neighbor or somebody in a neighborhood, what do you care about? How is this affecting you? And try to connect some piece of a nature-based solution to that so that they'll get excited. You know, maybe something as simple as talking about monarch butterfly, a very iconic species that everybody can identify with. You know, people don't always, people don't visualize, you know, what causes flooding. They see the effects of flooding but they don't know, always know what causes flooding. It's not easy to visualize. It's not easy to visualize 90% loss of wetlands in, in Illinois. Uh, you know, pure, pure devastation of prairies in Illinois and the benefits that those provided. So trying, trying to pick up on those services, and again, I know services, a, it's a buzzword, but you know, that they care about and, have, and frame the conversation around that to try to engage them and get them excited. Elena Arvinia? Yeah, so adding to what Aaron said, I think, you know, I, I said in my little um, intro too that it's meeting people where they're at, right? So it's also trying to understand the ways in which people currently may relate with nature, how they perceive it, what they, how they define it. Um, there is a very, I mean, I, I'm preaching to the core here when I say this, but there is a very common um, misconception, conception amongst communities of color, including that of mine, that nature is for white people. <laughs> You know, there is that sense that engaging with nature, but that's absolutely not the case because, you know, for obvious reasons, but also when you start to tap into um, the historical traditions, cultural traditions that different communities of color have had and the way that they engage with nature, what nature means, um, you actually start to tap into some of these um, nature-based solutions. You can actually come up with that. So when you use the term green infrastructure, you mention a rain garden, people in my experience don't really react much to that, right? Or I've heard green infrastructure means that it's infrastructure, so it's only something a city can do. Um, but when you start to actually talk about what is it that the nature-based solution is doing to try to mitigate flooding, you'll come up with a wealth of knowledge, um, cultural knowledge, historical knowledge on how we've done this in the past. We're just trying to, at least in the urban context, recreate it in an urban context a little bit, right? So it's trying to really build that connection. Um, and Ted, to your, you know, the first part of your question that it takes time and we need to really allow for that. It's not something where you can just start knocking on doors. You need to find local partners, regardless of what fields they're working in, but those who actually are from the community that you're concerned with and know the community, work with them, build on what they know. And if you're bringing in the technical expertise, whether it's on the ecological side or the health or social science side, but you're bringing that in to leverage and build capacity of people who already know a lot. And so then you can work together to find those solutions. But it's the time factor, which um, we often you know, don't account for. 
the, the only thing that I'll add to that is also building the relationship and trust because you know when you do that you you might be able to jump into a conversation that was maybe touchy before um you know i've encountered that where in just talking about climate change in general and initially finding common ground okay fine let's just work on emergency preparedness we both agree that there that that there are um that flooding is becoming more worse and more frequent we can talk about why later um, and then as you build that relationship and that trust, you can then circle back to that conversation. And, um, you know, people might, you're more willing to listen to someone that you have a relationship with. Thank you all. Um, so we're about out of time, unfortunately. Uh, Danny, do you want me to read the questions from the chat or do you want to handle those or how do you want to? Yeah, I'm happy to hop in and, and ask a couple of questions. Um, okay. We are approaching close to three, but I'm I could talk to this panel for like two more hours. So I think we can go over a little bit if everyone's all right with that. I'm fine um, with that. Awesome. The first question we had was for Aaron. Um, Whitney asked, "Where does restoring ecological memory fit into the Illinois restoration agenda? Um, how can ecological education and cultural work help contribute to goals of restoration?" Yeah, very good question. So when I when I hear the term ecological memory, I think of, you know, pre settlement landscapes landscapes that were very much maintained in here uh, when Europeans arrived because of Native Americans. And so that certainly is a piece of it, you know, we want to uh, use that traditional ecological knowledge for maintenance uh, of our ecosystems for application and nature based solutions. But I, I would also urge that that is not the best for every situation. You know, we need to understand the circumstances of a given site. Uh, again, it may be economics, it may be uh, socioeconomics, you know, what, what are the goals uh, of a restoration and really try to do what's best for the site to work with nature, not against it. Because the fact is our landscape has changed so much, it's not always possible to get back to where it was. But we can, we can certainly realize a lot of benefits, a lot of stacked benefits, like I talked about um, from doing something. Right, so I think, um, great question. We do very much rely on that, that traditional ecological knowledge um, for really application in all of our local ecosystems. Awesome. Um, we had another question that didn't specify, so I'll open up to everybody. Um, speaking, you know, from as Chicago continues to lose beachfront um, across the city, uh, what do you recommend to help change the mindset of people who are coming from a nature for my use perspective to more of a we're all in this together so let's solve a problem kind of perspective? What can be done to kind of move that conversation? I'll just take a quick stab at this because I think it's bigger than just um, about beaches because this kind of gets to the culture of our country. You know we have a more of an individualistic perspective. We can see that with COVID and um, and mask wearing, and it's not just about me, it's about we. Um, and so I think that's a, you know, it's that really gets at I, I one of our challenges as a country and um, moving more to a, how, how can we all do this together? Um, I don't know if I have a complete answer, but you know, New York City has always done it quite well. Um, I don't know if it's how the city is designed, um, the culture of the city, but they really do have this, we're all in this together attitude. Um, you know, I think the more that we talk about how we are all being impacted might, um, you know, might have, might help in terms of looking at it at different, at, di at in many different angles, whether it's health, whether it's, um, um, infrastructure, um, whatever, like, however, there's so many different angles and maybe it'll just take m so many different angles to where we can all get to this place of we and not me. Maybe somebody else has a, a, a better answer to <laughs> address that big cultural problem. It's a big question, right? <laughs> I mean, if what we can I solve it on the panel, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, right. That's like a whole, like another series, right? Um, you know, in my work, and it, like I started out in my introduction explaining, you know, what really kind of 
really gets me excited in the work that I do is, is a couple of things. Number one is just to see, you know, ecosystems turn around and nature-based solutions, the fact that they work and they work quickly and they're really beneficial, but it's really when nature and community come together, really at the grassroots level. And so I think, you know, we do need to make uh, really systematic wholesale changes uh, in order to solve this crisis. And you often hear uh, negativity around, well, I can't solve this myself, so I'm not gonna do anything. But I think those grassroots movements, and maybe that speaks to New York City a little bit, uh, it, 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 it's a groundswell, right? It starts with a grassroots, grassroots movement, it was a groundswell, then all of a sudden, you know, it's picked up by media, and it's talked about, it's integrated into, you know, uh, planning and policy and curriculum. and. So I think that's how really things get going. I think we have examples of that over the last 50 years with the environmental movement, um, starting with Rachel Carson. We have examples to work off of. Um, so we can lead on some of that as well. And I'll just add that we should freely, freely borrow um, approaches and, and lessons from different fields. You know, So like in, in health, we have so many different examples of, of, of programs that have managed to change behaviors. Um, and we, we need to learn those lessons. It's not simply just about educating people, but there are so many other triggers and ways to change the social norms around it. I, I used to work in rural sanitation, so like, you know, latrines and toilets, right, in villages. And, and this idea was just, we need to give people the toilet and that's all that takes and people will use the toilet. But instead, when you start to understand, and the refrain used to always be in our sanitation community, well, but there's Coke everywhere. Like you go to the tiniest village somewhere in, in Southeast Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa and there is Coke, but there's no toilet. How do we make that work, you know? Um, I'm not saying that we've figured it out in sanitation yet <laughs> either, but it's this idea of meeting people where they're at. Sorry, I keep saying that over and over, but I really strongly believe that, right? And not saying, you need a toilet, this is what's gonna work. Is it affecting your health? How is it affecting your health? Is it affecting your life, your dignity? So is nature being affected in some way by your actions that's going to then come back and hurt you again? So it's, it's having those series of conversations and learning about, you know, from behavioral science and behavioral economics and all of these fields, what are the different um, tactics and tools that have proven to work um, to change behaviors that goes beyond what I've noticed in, in, in the environmental realm will still we talk about education and outreach. It's a little bit more than that. There have to be other you know, marketing tools basically that need to be brought in. Absolutely. Well, um, I don't want to, I don't want to go too far over time. We have a couple other questions I don't think we'll be able to get to. Um, really quickly, I'm going to launch a super short multiple choice poll. If anybody, if everybody could just take it really quickly, um, let us know how we can improve our next, our upcoming sessions, I should say. Uh, and to that end, our next session next week will be uh, focusing on renewable energy, talking about policies, practices, and implications of renewable energy in Illinois. Um, I want to say a big thank you again to all of our panelists here for joining us. Like I said, I could sit and talk about engagement in nature, community engagement and nature-based solutions for a very long time with each of these people. Um, and I just am so grateful to you, Ted, as well, for helping us to moderate this awesome conversation um, and frame this really important topic. Uh, you know, this series is all about just and sustainable change going forward, and these are the conversations we need to be having. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and with that, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, as these, I guess we have some time as people finish up the last polls. Erin, we had one question that someone was really excited to ask you, so I want to ask really quick. Um, Agriculture is one of the largest industries in Illinois, and uh, Dahlia was wondering if you could speak to what is preventing farmers from transitioning to more sustainable alternatives like hydroponics. Um, yeah, I think it, it's, to me, it's a cultural issue. Uh, we see this a lot with farmers and, and really rural populations really holding tight to the land because that's, that's what they know, and they feel like the way that they farmed and the way that they farmed for a long time is the right way to do it. So it, it is not an, an easy change. Um, I believe uh, a lot of people have tried, are trying uh, over, I mean, over decades now to, to make that happen. I, I, I wouldn't say that progress isn't happening. Um, I think if you look at some of the resiliency models and show that show some of the greatest 
uh, impacts of land use. It's on it's definitely on changing farming practices, but it's on very simple things. It's like on cover cropping, putting cover crops in uh, as part of uh, farming practices. And we're seeing that more and more. I think, it, again, it goes back to everything we said today, connecting with the landowner. You can't say, okay, what you're doing is wrong. Therefore, it's affecting me. Therefore, you have to change it. So it's engaging with them. You know, what I find is, you know, even on the pollinator conversation, uh, they really engage in that because they understand that pollinators are important for food production. They understand the importance of soil health. So if you go to them and talk about the benefits of cover crops on soil health, they're very engaged in that. You can't go to them and say, you need to plant a cover crop because there's it's going to prevent climate change. They don't, that's a non-starter for them. Right. So it has to again speak at their level and, and really hit on what what their concern is and get stack those benefits of those of those activities. Fantastic. I yep. think uh, if there's one thing anyone takes away from the session today, meeting people where they're at stacked benefits of nature-based solutions um, and the importance of bringing uh, this into the context of the public health arena, the, uh, the context of, of how climate change impacts our, our neighbors and our communities. Um, thank you again to everybody who joined us today. One more round of silent applause from our audience for our awesome panelists, Aaron, Alana, Vidya, thank you so much for joining us. And um, we'll see, we hope to see you again next week at our, uh, our next session. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.